ಬಿಟ್ಟು of our country indeed a very very special occasion for all of us as we start to remember all those who were involved in the building up of the nation welcome you once again to this meeting and this is an ipd hepatology meet and uh, today's meeting consists of two uh, very interesting uh, talks followed by panel discussions. Now for the first talk, of course, we have uh, none other than Professor uh, Dr. Anil Arora. Uh, Dr. Anil Arora is the Chairman, Institute of Liver, Gastroenterology and Liberty Sciences at Dr. Gangaram Hospital, uh, a very senior, very well-known and very academic gastroenterologist, if I could say that, a person who is known for the strength as far as his basics in gastroenterology is concerned. And today, of course, he's going to talk to us or answer the question, why should the liver be linked to This will be followed by another keynote uh, address by Dr. Oshul Madan, Principal Director and Head Clinical Hepatology gastroenterology and endoscopy at the Max Hospital, Purga. And he'll be talking to us on an approach to altered liver chemistry in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. How do we approach a, such a situation? And that will be followed by a panel discussion. And of course, we, are, we would be welcoming the latest or newest entrant into the IBD ENC group, Iraq. Welcome you. And we will have a session towards the end as well. Well, uh, uh, before uh, we go on to the details of the panel, we first would like to complete or get over with the two talks. And may I request Professor Anil Arora to answer the question for us, why should the liver be linked to inflammatory bowel? Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramesh for a very kind introduction and I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Rupa and her team from AIG for having given me this opportunity. Are my slides visible? Yes, yes they are. The topic which was allotted to me by Rupa and she has a habit of allotting a difficult topic to me and relatively easier topic to her friend Dr. Kaushal Madan. So this is the first complaint I have to register. In any case, I'm going to talk on pathophysiology of hepatobiliary manifestation. And that, that is precisely the reason why there is a link between the gut and the liver. Now, inflammatory bowel disease is associated with swathe and myriads of problems in the hepatobiliary regions, which may be related to the so-called extra intestinal manifestation of the disease in inflammatory bowel disease. They may be concomitant associated diseases like chronic hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or autoimmune hepatitis as a part and parcel of other liver diseases. And then there may be a number of other diseases which may be ensuing just because we happen to give them a Consider variety of agents which will lead to immunosuppression. As Dr. Ramesh had very aptly asked, why is it that we do talk of liver when we are talking of a disease which is primarily confined to gut called inflammatory bowel disease. Is there a holy or unholy alliance between the two? I am going to present you some facts. I hope that will make some clarification regarding this but concept. Not going to be now, between the gut and the liver, there is an intimate relationship. 
that is because of the embryological reason because both of the organs they originate from the same layer they are anatomically located quite near to each other and they serve a number of function with commonality in terms of the physiological responses so ultimately gut liver axis is the central fulcrum in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease all of us we know that anything and everything you eat anything and everything you digest and process in the gut that coupled with the number of the nutrients drug you know biotics and a number of bacteria and its products they by default have to go to the liver before entering the circulation through the heart to this system called portal main so you just cannot forget liver for whatever has been happening you in your gut whether it is a normal absorption of the food consumption of the drugs and the various myriad manifestation of the residing 3 billion bacteria which have been making merry in the gut liver on its own also tends to have no less effect on the intestine it is a bidirectional talk it also produces a number of substances including antimicrobial substances free free iga as well as bile in an effort to have some control on the gut so it is a bidirectional link between the gut and the liver so this reciprocal relationship between the two leads to two important maneuvers the first is an immune homeostasis that would mean any pathogenic bacteria is transgressing the boundaries of the gut and is seeping into the liver through the portal vein is taken care of by hepatic super cells that means all upcoming microorganisms or bacteria will be taken care of uh, by the cooper cells as they are pathogenic organisms but every food component most of the drugs and the number of the metabolites of the bacteria are tolerated by the liver on day to day basis whatever you eat is not rejected by the body in fact it is taken to the liver where liver and that this is something which has to be tolerated in So what is this all due to balance between this is that means get rid of the pathogen. The common all is guided by a combination of determined by the type of the mix, but type of the diet you are the basic genetic background of which step of RNA DNA. Only the environment factor. As a frontline organ facing the crux of the barrier, liver can maintain this balance of either head pathogenic organism potential and the commercial bacteria and drugs. Is it maintained by? It is maintained by of. cell form hepatic cell hepatic sinusoid the new in region and then they tend to protect the harmful harmful pathogenic bacteria 
going into the second layer called mucin. Now, this mucin is the layer which is just above the epithelial layer. It has number of the components which include defensins as well as entry microbial substances. Then you have the structural component called epithelium, which between the two epithelial cells has very tight junction, intracellular junction, which will prevent the passage of the harmful bacteria and its product down into the submucosa. Then you have components of immune system. which tend to give it a shape in terms of innate immunity. And finally, a new concept which has recently again propped up is something called gut vascular barrier. What this means is to maintain the gut integrity, you need to have a, it is basically a functional unit which prevents the adherence of the bacteria and its product and prevents it traf trafficking down into the portal vein. A new entity is something which has been recently described, this is called gut vascular barrier. What it does, it prevents the translocation of the bacteria from the gut to the bloodstream. It is basically formed by the endothelial cells, which are linked by the tight junction in close contact with fibroblasts and, and the parasites. So this is the human of the gut. So as the gut substances, including the microbiome, the food, and the drug metabolites, they tend to enter into the circulation. So this functional gut gut vascular barrier. This is akin to something which we very well know of or something called blood brain, brain barrier in the blood allows initially only 4,000 4, Dalton or 4K molecules. That means 4,000 Dalton molecules only can transgress this Kusa. That means it keeps you intact so far as does not allow you and permit uh, uh, a passage of the harmful bacteria across the gut vascular barrier into the portal circulation. However, somewhere down the lane, whenever there is an injury, gut mucosa, and whenever this mucosal uh, component is disrupted because of the number of reasons, like in presence of inflammatory bowel disease, so large number of the endotoxins, lipopolysaccharide, peptoglycans, and lipotechoic acid, they tend to transgress through this disrupted mucosa. Now, this is not 70 kD, this is only 70 T. Earlier, 4,500 Dalton molecules could go. Now, with disruption of the gut barrier mucosa, you have even smaller substance up to 70 delta, 70 Dalton can easily transgress the mucosal barrier and enter into the circulation. So, these endotoxins, gram negative bacilli, lipopolysaccharide, uh, uh, and peptoglycans or lipotechoic acid, they have an easy access to the portal circulation. The gut barrier prevents the translocation of the microbiome antigen into the portal circulation and small components of the microbiome called molecular patterns associated with the bacteria, they are detected by the Cooper cells before they enter into the circulation. So God has given us good immunity. Even after they transgress, transgress the gut barrier, you have Cooper cells sitting in the sinusoidal epithelium, which will take care of the bacteria. So in physiological setting, there is a state of tolerance, which will lead to reduction in the recruitment of the activated T cells, which will prevent the proliferation of the T cells, which are harmful for the body. In the normal course of the events, you have two barriers, which I've already described, the gut barrier as well as the Cooper cell. There is a description of this new entity called mucosal associated invariant T cells. These are the specialized types of T cells which have, have, have a habit of residing into the porta hepatis. So this is what happens. This is the porta hepatis. This is a magnified view of the portal venule. This is the bile duct and this is the hepatic artery venule. So you have a specialized type of the T cells, which initially home into the portal venous endothelium. And from there, they transmigrate into the portal areas near the bile duct. So as soon as they encounter an, any antigen which is coming into the portal circulation, there is a regranulation of the tissue, and this causes release of interferon gamma, which prevents the bile duct. So in the normal course of the events, there is no way you can damage your liver by entering through the portal venous system or into the biliary tract. So this new concept of mite cells is the third barrier which prevents the passage of the uh, bacterial products to cause activation of the immune system. So once all these, 
all these barriers have been disrupted. So you will have a large amount of the lipopolysaccharide and uh, uh, peptidoglycans, which will be entering into the circulation. And once they enter into the circulation, you have crossed all the boundaries, then you have a swathe of inflammatory sites like Cooper cells, sinusoidal endothelial cells, which will have a limit of tolerance, and subsequently they are the ones which are responsible for ca causing inflammatory milieu. So, ladies and gentlemen, a combination of the leaky gut along with the reduction in the tolerance capacity of the uh, microbium, antimicrobial products is something which will lead to chronic inflammation. And the classical and the prototype example is the primary sclerosing cholangitis. If you look at the literature of the relationship between inflammatory bowel disease and primary sclerosing cholangitis, somehow it is distinctly uncommon in our part of the world. Overall, about 2 to 3% of the patients with inflammatory bowel disease will have primary sclerosing cholangitis. But if you look at primary sclerosing cholangitis, 70 to 80% of the patients will have inflammatory bowel disease. So which patients are more likely to have inflammatory bowel disease will depend on where you live, what is your sex, do you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So the incidence of PSC is highest in the South America, whereas in India, we have very low incidence. In ulcerative colitis, PSC is far more common than in Crohn's disease. And even in ulcerative colitis, you have a typical phenotype. Need to have a pancolitis or a rectal sparing or a backwash ileitis. Unless you have all these three features, the chance of having a PSC is very low. This is the data still in review given by Dr. Ajit Sood. 12,000 patients in India, the occurrence of PSC is dismally low, 0.39%. That is a good news for, in, uh, uh, for India. And if you look at the composition of uh, Crohn's disease versus, ulcerative, versus the uh, 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 ulcerative colitis in causation of PSC, two-thirds of the patient have, uh, with the PSC have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease account for only 20% of the patient. Again, repetition of the same thing. You need to have either a pancolitis, backwash colitis, or rectal sparing. This is the phenotype of primary sclerosing cholangitis in patients who have a concomitant uh, inflammatory bowel disease and PSC. What is the reason? Why is it that the patient with inflammatory bowel disease tend to have primary sclerosing cholangitis? Initially, Dr. Kaushal would remember that we were taught in our gastroenterology ward at AIMS that this is an autoimmune disease because you have autoantibodies like a ANCA, ANA, and SMA, which are positive. But what is baffling is, if it is an autoimmune disease, why does it not respond to steroids? We know PSC doesn't respond to steroids. And why is it more common in males, uh, unlike, inflame, unlike autoimmune diseases, which by default tend to occur more frequently in females? So is this association tangible? The answer is possible, no. The reason for this is the new upcoming concept of a particular homing hypothesis of aberrant expression of the molecules which are common in the gut and liver. And hence, people who have inflamed bowel will have inflamed liver as well. The concept is once you have an antigen which is present in the lumen of the gut, the abnormal, once it transgresses the gut barrier, it is picked up by the dendritic cells. You have an enzyme called retinoic acid dehydrogenase, which fortunately resides only in the intestinal mucosa. It is not present anywhere in the body. Now, what th this enzyme does is it converts retinoic acid into retinol. And as the retinoic acid is converted into retinol, dendritic cells, which have picked up this antigen coming from the gut lumen, they tend to cause maturation of the T cell and two specific integrins come onto the surface of the T cell. So these antigens are called alpha-4 and beta-7. At the same time, inflamed gut, epithelium also has overexpression of an adhesion molecule called MADCAM1. So two things are occurring in inflamed bowel. Incoming antigens, because of retinoic acid metabolism, is developing specialized type of T cell receptors, which have a good tendency to bind to this abnormally expressed adhesion in the vascular endothelium of the gut. So overexpression of MADCAM, which is an adhesive molecule in the vascular endothelium, and the T cell receptors, alpha 4 and beta 7, that leads to homing of the cells to the gut mucosa. And from there, these cells migrate into the mucosa and hence give them initial protection. Till the disease becomes advanced, 
and this gut barrier mucosa is overwhelmed. Same thing is happening in the in the portal vein as well as in the sinusoidal area. In the normal course of the events, there is a less expression of this mad cam and there is hardly any expression of other adhesion molecule. But in patients who have ulcerative colitis, there is excessive expression of this aberrant molecule even in the liver vascular endothelium to which come and attach these cells which have this special specialized integrins which I have already mentioned as alpha 1 and beta 7. So what is the causal role of the gut microbiome in all this? In fact, there have been studies which have shown various type of microbiota in different diversities and different presentation in PSC and, and IBD. And one thing which has been cons consistently shown is in the meta-analysis that belly neola is something which has been repeatedly found to be higher in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Are these changes mediated by genetic risk? In fact, there have been 16 HLAs which have been associated with development of the PSC in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, which accounts only for 7% of the total explanation of occurrence of uh, uh, PSC in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So these are the various association. And as I said, uh, this accounts only for 7% of the total causation of PSC in IBD. Does it translate into any clinic, clinical reality, whatever we have been talking about. Let's see vidolizumab. Now, this is the drug which I have showed you that T, the T cell lymphocytes, they tend to have specialized type of integrin called alpha-4 and beta-7, and they get attached to this adhesion molecule, which is expressed, overexpressed in the endothelium of the gut and the liver. Now, if you go and neutralize this by blocking this combination of MADCAM with alpha-4, beta-7 by this drug called uh, vidolizumab, you will prevent the migration of the cell into the submucosa and hence will prevent the injury occurring in the tissues like in the liver and the biliary tract epithelium. So this was a study conducted which showed that in this particular study, addition of vidolizumab in patients with PS in inflammatory bowel disease did not change the course of the illness in patients who had established primary sclerosing cholangitis. What about microbiota? Can we tweak them? Can we alter their function and structure? In fact, we have shown that these are the microbial products which are important in stimulation of the dendritic cells to produce specialized types of integrins and expression of the aberrant molecules. So vancomycin is one drug which is known to be useful. In fact, in this study, it has been shown that if you give vancomycin in a subgroup of the patient with inflammatory bowel disease and PSC, there has been a substantial clinical improvement. There was improvement in the liver function test. The reason mentioned is that vancomycin typically causes antibacterial bacterial activity against an organism called Clostridium organism, which is responsible for conversion of the primary biliary acids to the secondary biliary acids, acid. And the more secondary biliary acids are formed, the more will be the damage to the mucosa. And hence, by reduction of the uh, this uh, Clostridium, you are going to activate the problem and in, uh, have improvement in the inflammatory bowel disease. What about stimulation of the T regulatory cells? Can we tone down the inflammation in the liver? In fact, it has been tried, at least in the experimental animals, that if you give IL-2 infusion, that is going to decrease the pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-17 and tend to increase anti-inflammatory IL-10 uh, IL cytokines, which are useful for decreasing the inflammation in the inflamed liver as well as in the inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, in some of the concomitant conditions like in type 1 diabetes mellitus and SLE, this down-regulation of the inflammatory milieu by up-regulation of the regulated T cells have been shown to be useful, but some of it has still not been tried in autoimmune liver disease. So finally, once you have transgressed all the boundaries, you will have a destructive influx of the inflammatory cells because nothing can be done, and then there is a substantial damage which occurs over a period of time uh, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. But one, one fails to explain as to why what happens in patients who have removal of the colon and still have aggravation of uh, PSC, or else if they have transplantation and still there is an aggravation of uh, gut activity in terms of inflammation in the gut. The reason mentioned is once you have been able to inside the effector T cells, which contain alpha-4 and beta-7, 
seven type of integrin, they tend to produce so-called memory cells. These memory cells have a tendency to hide in the hideouts in the bone marrow. And whenever they're exposed to an antigen, be it in the liver or in the gut, in spite of a colectomy, you can have aggravation of PSC. And in spite of a liver transplantation, you can have activity which is flared up in the intestine. The reason mentioned is the primed T cells, which are hiding in the hideouts in the bone marrow, are responsible for all this problem. Then you have swathe of problem associated with alcoholic liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And other than the fact that it is otherwise prevalent in 30% of the population, we have specific risk factors in inflammatory bowel disease, and one can go from a normal to a diseased liver, and this could be related to the drugs, the side effects, the, uh, the redundancy of the patient, and a number of agents which will per se induce the fatty liver formation. Polylithiasis is far more common in Crohn's disease, almost double the risk of uh, than that of a general population. The reason mentioned is there is a decrease in the absorption of the bile acid from the inflamed distal gut. So the Crohn's disease patients have almost double the incidence of the gallbladder. Similarly, patients with the inflammatory bowel disease are more likely to have portal vein thrombosis by a risk factor of a hazard ratio of 2.8. And the reasons mentioned are, are multitudes. You have uh, impaired fibrinolysis, you have dehydration, malnutrition, and the number of central lines which predispose to thrombosis. HBV reactivation, I think Dr. Uh, Rupa has already kept a complete session after the presentation. Uh, and we know very well that patients with hepatitis B on immunosuppression are likely to get reactivated if you give them potent immunosuppression and we have to assess their immune status prior to start of the therapy. So this we can discuss during the discussion. And uh, whether we need to give them antiviral or we give them uh, uh, just observatory methodology will depend on their status. We in fact published these guidelines. Kaushal was a part of this uh, guideline process in which we published the uh, indications for using uh, antivirals in patients who are immunosuppressed. This was not meant for IBD alone, it was across the board for patients who were giving immunosuppressive for any infusion. Granulometer hepatitis is an uncommon manifestation, and uh, there may be problems related to drug usage. A large number of the drugs used in ulcerative colitis can cause inflammation in the gall, in the liver because of the direct toxicity or because of the idiosyncrasy. Uh, and finally, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, patient with inflammatory bowel disease and, and uh, PSC. And the basic pathogenesis is that there is a good intimate relationship because of the embryological, anatomical, and physiological relationship between the gut and the liver. Continuous flow of the commensals in the form of food antigen, drug, xenobiotic, leads the liver to development of the tolerance. However, there is a protective mechanism for the upcoming microbiota by three tire defense mechanism, which is present in the gut barrier, the hepatic Cooper cell, and the new entity called biliary mate cell. Disruption of this gut barrier after allows the endotoxin, some negative bacilli, and lipopolysaccharide to translocate across the portal vein and trigger the inflammatory response. And once there is an aberrant expression of the gut homing molecule, that is both the integrins as well as the vascular endothelial molecule, adhesion molecule called MADCAM, you have a persistent and long-standing inflammation which was triggered by the first disruption of the gut mucosal immunity. And this mucosal memory T cells are recruited again and again to the liver to cause a link between the two. With that, I'll stop sharing my site and hand it over back to Dr. Ramesh and Dr. Rupa. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Professor Anil Arora, that was indeed a roller coaster ride, a journey into the cellular mechanisms. A uh, lot of answers were there. Of course, there are a lot of questions too. Uh, we'll have a discussion later, uh, but we'll go on straight away to the situation. Uh, now, the situation is that uh, a patient with inflammatory bowel disease as uh, an altered liver chemistry. So how to proceed, how to approach this situation, how to see the situation is what Dr. Kaushal Madan will uh, answer. Over to you, Kaushal, for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thanks to Dr. Uh, Ramesh, AIG Hospitals, Dr. Rupa, uh, for making me part of this 
forum uh, today evening. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Let just give me a second to share my slide. So, are my slides visible? Yes, yes sir. They are. You go to the first idea. So uh, initially, I thought I'll present it in the form of a case, but then I thought there was already a panel discussion. So I have just uh, introduced uh, what kind of uh, scenarios we might have uh, in a patient who has IBD and a deranged liver function, and then talked about the differential diagnosis and how to approach. So altered liver chemistry in a patient with IBD. So uh, just to start, Give you an example a 40 year old male with a history of ulcerative colitis mainly left sided of almost eight years duration poorly compliant patient having recurrent relapses every one to three years when he would reach us and uh, get treated for the same and then of course after the remission he would disappear when he came this time uh, his weight was 78 height was 160 centimeters and on routine health checkup, he was detected to have deranged liver function test for which he was referred to us. So these were the values, bilirubin of 1, uh, AST 79, ALT 98, alkaline phosphates and GDT just one and a half times or two times upper limit of normal and a maintained uh, liver synthetic function. So I think this is a, this is a common scenario which uh, many physicians who have been dealing with IBD uh, would be coming across. So I think the first uh, first step is to uh, look at the differential diagnosis and make a diagnosis and proceed from there. I remember, and I, I think all of us would have uh, uh, learned in our uh, training days, and I think it was given the textbook also, that any patient of IBD who has a deranged LFT, the first diagnosis at that time to be considered was uh, was primary sclerosing cholangitis unless proved otherwise. I think that has now changed and we have realized that there are a number of reasons because of which the LFTs might be deranged. So these may be related to the IBD per se, for example, PSC, overlap syndrome or drug induced liver injury. Unrelated to IBD, for example, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, chronic viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, or CBD stones. You just heard uh, Dr. Anil Arora also during uh, the uh, last part of his talk talking about these things. So I think now, now the tables have turned. If a patient like this comes to us, I think uh, with the kind of prevalence we have of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the first thing which comes to mind is, uh, in a, as a differential diagnosis, is that this patient who has a high BMI, uh, might be having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease rather than PSC. So let's look at what, why we are saying this. If we look at the gro global prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, this is a uh, systematic review of 86 studies from 24 countries, 22 countries, global prevalence of almost 25%. In Asia, about 27%. Uh, this is a recent study from uh, AIMS, again a meta-analysis in which uh, all these studies from uh, on which looked at the uh, burden of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in India were compiled and you can see the prevalence is almost close to 40% in adults. So it, it's not uh, difficult to imagine that a patient who has IBD and also has other metabolic risk factors might indeed be having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So uh, there are also studies which have looked at the uh, burden of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in IBD patients. So this was a study of 1,600 IBD patients between uh, 2007 and 2017. 14 percent had imaging or biopsy evidence of hepatic stenosis. When they excluded other secondary causes, 12.4 percent had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This was a study in which they followed IBD patients and then looked at how many of them uh, developed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease later on in life. So 321 IBD patients without having uh, any known liver dysfunction at baseline were followed up for uh, more than 1100 person years and 33% developed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
NAFLD obviously was diagnosed based on hepatic uh, stetosis index. And this is a recent meta-analysis of 44 studies, more than 14,000 subjects, and they found that the pooled prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in IBD patients is about 30%. So we see that almost a third of IBD patients would be having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so I think the most common cause of mildly deranged LFTs in such patients would be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And obviously, we need to work them up further. So in this particular study, there was no difference between uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis in terms of their prevalence of fatty liver. The factors which are independently associated with NAFLD in these patients were advanced age and presence of BMI. So that's nothing surprising. This is a disease uh, which is associated with metabolic syndrome uh, in patients who have uh, obesity. So coming to the other common causes, this is, uh, we all know, we've discussed this issue of primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aroda did talk about that in his talk also. So he did talk about this particular study, a meta-analysis of 64 studies of more than uh, 7 lakh patients. And it was found that uh, the prevalence of PSC overall was about 2.1%. In ulcerative colitis, uh, it was higher and CD in Crohn's disease, it was less than a percent. And those who had indeterminate colitis, the prevalence was about 5%. And it was significantly higher in patients who had colitis rather than uh, small bowel involvement. And as the small bowel involvement in increased, for example, in Crohn's disease and colitic involvement reduced, so did the burden of PSC in these IBD patients. Obviously, patients who had pancolitis had higher incidence as compared to those who had left-sided colitis within those who had ulcerative colitis. He also showed this particular slide, uh, the data from India, which is yet to be published, of more than 12,000 patients. Only 0.39% patients had uh, a coexisting or a uh, concomitant inflammatory uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and it was significantly more common in patients who had ulcerative colitis than those who had Crohn's disease. Now, this is important to uh, be able to diagnose PSC in these patients because of the, uh, because of the uh, uh, different natural history these patients might have, especially in terms of uh, development of malignancies, for example, colorectal cancers and uh, cholangiocarcinomas. Again, this is a meta-analysis of 16 studies of more than 13,000 IBD patients, of whom 1,022 had PSC, and the odds ratio for development of colorectal carcinoma was significantly higher. It was 3.24 in PSC IBD versus patients who had IBD alone, and this risk was significantly higher in patients who had ulcerative colitis than those who had Crohn's disease. Regarding the risk of cholangiocellular carcinoma, that also is increased. So this study, over a follow-up period of 9.4 years, 31% uh, patients over this follow-up time uh, who had PSC IBD developed cholangiocellular carcinoma, which is a huge burden and a, a huge incidence. And the factors which were associated with development of CCA were duration of IBD. Those who had longer duration of inflammatory bowel disease before they developed PSC were more likely to develop cholangiocellular carcinoma. And patients who had undergone colectomy were also the ones who were more likely to develop cholangiocellular carcinoma, especially if the colectomy was done for colorectal carcinoma, uh, obviously on a background of IBD. The third important cause is chronic viral hepatitis. Again, Dr. Uh, uh, Arora did mention about it. So uh, the prevalence of viral hepatitis in IBD, this is a study from Italy in which uh, they compared cases, IBD cases, about 807 with controls and found that both the prevalence of HBV and HCV was similar in the IBD cases and controls. So like in the general population, you will have similar prevalence of HBV and HCV. And obviously, there are recommendations that patients should be screened for this, especially before uh, you start them on biological. 
So this is a study from India, uh, from uh, Dr. Vineet Ahuja's group. So 908 uh, IBD cases, 581 of them ulcerative colitis, and then they took controls, which were patients of intestinal tuberculosis, 95 of them. And then they looked at, compared it with the prevalence data from uh, the general Indian population. And as you can see that as compared to uh, the, the, the prevalence of HPV, HCV, and HIV were similar in the groups of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and almost similar in patients who had uh, intestinal tuberculosis. And this also matched the prevalence in the general population. So when you encounter a patient of uh, IBD who had a deranged LFT, I think all these things, different diagnosis should be considered and your, uh, uh, the algorithm should be based on these differential diagnosis, and I'll come to that. And finally, the issue of drug-induced liver injury. Uh, we know that among the uh, drugs which are used for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, I think thiopurines are the ones which uh, are most likely to be associated with uh, some form of liver injury. Uh, and many a times, it is more of uh, uh, nodular regenerative hyperplasia on chronic use of uh, azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine and it has been shown that this risk can be reduced with concomitant administration of allopurinol. The liver injury with the use of salicylates, anti-TNF-alpha, anti-integrins are very rare. I'll come to that. I'll show you some studies also. With methotrexate, with long-term use, it leads to uh, fatty liver disease or even direct uh, patients who are exposed to methotrexate on higher doses for longer duration, uh, it may lead to fibrosis. And it has been shown that this also happens in those patients who have metabolic syndrome, possibly suggesting that it is the underlying NAFLD which is driving it rather than methotrexate. And finally, the, the new drug, the new kid on the block, uh, the JAK inhibitors, so facetinib, uh, which is available in the Indian market, the risk of developing deranged LFTs is up to the tune of 1 to 2 percent, but mostly it is self limiting even if you continue these drugs, especially if the, the, the uh, deranged liver functions are mild. <clears throat> so, uh, these are the two studies which have looked at the, uh, the uh, association of anti TNF alpha when it was given with. Uh, given to patients with IBD, PSC, and its impact on PSC and uh, liver biochemistry. So these were 141 patients with IBD, PSC, who received either infliximab or adalimumab, and they showed that uh, the, the, with uh, infliximab, the reduction in ALP was about 4%. It was significantly higher in patients who were receiving adalimumab, but uh, in terms of clinically meaningful response, there was no effect uh, of uh, NTTNF uh, drugs on uh, the natural history of PSC. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, with vidolizumab, uh, when it was given in 102 patients of IBD with PSC, vidolizumab, uh, they had received at least three doses when this analysis was done for a median duration of 412 days. They found that almost all parameters of liver biochemistry, AST, ALT, ALP, and bilirubin they went up mildly, but that was not clinically significant. And they found that almost 20% patients also had a more than 20% drop in uh, alkaline phosphatase, again, without any clinically meaningful response, uh, uh, again, suggesting that although it has anti-alpha-4, uh, beta-7 integrin activity, it still is not able to treat PSC or have a, a clinically meaningful response in these patients, but yes, these two su studies suggest that uh, vidalizumab or anti TNF alpha themselves do not cause any drug induced liver injury. And finally, the drug, in drug interaction for HPV, I think we'll have a, a detailed discussion in the, uh, in the uh, panel discussion which is to be followed. So finally, this is how these patients should be approached IBD patients with deranged LFT. This is the algorithm. So uh, these patients may have a hepatocellular uh, pattern of liver injury alone, polystatic pattern alone, or a mixed pattern. When it is hepatocellular alone and it is mild, you should consider uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or chronic viral hepatitis or DILI and lower down also keep in mind primary sclerosing cholangitis. 
Obviously, the workup would include viral markers, ultrasound fibro scan, and other parameters to suggest whether these patients have metabolic syndrome or not. If they have a cholestatic pattern alone, then obviously the first differential diagnosis is PSC followed by uh, still could be drug-induced liver injury. And the first investigations here should be MRCP. Obviously, you have to exclude chronic viral hepatitis in any patient who presents with deranged LFTs. And you also have to exclude uh, the intake of other drugs. For example, it's a very common practice in India uh, that any patient who has a chronic illness would definitely would have tried uh, complementary and alternative medicines like Ayurveda or Yunani or homeopathy. And these are the drugs also which are associated with uh, uh, drug-induced liver injury, which has to be kept in mind. And whenever there is mixed pattern, again, PSC is the first uh, on the list, followed by Delhi, and NAFLD may also be associated with a rise in GGT. So you have to get viral markers followed by MRCP. But uh, 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 I would like to caution here that you should not get uh, <coughs> uh, diverted by the fact that patient only has hepatocellular uh, injury and you will not get an MRCP done. So my suggestion is that Ultimately, all patients of IBD who were deranged LFTs should have an MRCP to exclude PSC before you confidently say that PSC is not the cause for this. And finally, you treat each of these uh, based on uh, uh, their own uh, findings. So NAFLD, lifestyle management, there are no studies on the use of vitamin E or saroglitazar, but those appear to be the safest drugs which should be and can be used in patients with uh, NAFLD and concomitant IBD. Once you detect a patient of PSC, you treat it uh, on its own merits, but you also require annual screening for colorectal carcinoma and cholangiocellular carcinoma. These are the guidelines of most societies. Drug-induced liver injury, I told you that it is very important to exclude uh, the use of uh, other herbal medications. And once you... Uh, Reach our conclusion, you have to discontinue. Viral hepatitis, again, uh, I, I'm sure we'll have a detailed discussion on this, but uh, interferons are the ones which are to be avoided and directly affecting anti antivirals for hepatitis C and nucleoside or nucleotide analogs for hepatitis B are the ones which are recommended. Thank you for a patient. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaushal Madan. Uh, that was quite simple and elegant. Uh, before we go on to the panel discussion, I just like to ask Rupa, do we have any questions that have come into the chat box? Uh, while Rupa is uh, coming up with these questions, uh, Kaushal, just a quick question. I mean, of all the patients with altered liver functions and inflammatory bowel disease, what proportion of these patients finally end up undergoing a liver biopsy? So I think uh, with the now with the availability of a lot of tools like MRCP, I think most of the patients who have large large duct uh, uh, PSC would not require a liver biopsy. And second, we all know that in patients who have NAFLD, uh, there is probably no role. So only patients who have overlap syndrome and you are suspecting autoimmune hepatitis or an unexplained drug-induced liver injury would be the ones where uh, a biopsy would be required and that would be a, uh, a rare minority. I, I think less so, than so, so. Uh, uh, Professor Anil Arora, you also share this uh, yeah. opinion or uh, different? Yeah, I'll agree with uh, uh, Kaushal. If you look at the minor abnormalities, it depends on how do you define the abnormality. Is it just a minor elevation of above a conventional limit of nobody even knows the conventional limit? 25, 30, 40 different labs have different values. But a minor abnormality, more often than not, will be more ascribed to non alcoholic fatty liver disease for which you do not need this. If you look at the total spectrum of IBD, 30% will have LFT abnormalities, will depend on how do you define this abnormality. And coming out of the organic causes, as Kaushal has rightly said, there are very minuscule. 4 to 5% will have associated diseases like PSC or uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis or an overlap or a drug. If it is a drug-induced injury, the best option in most of us, what we do as clinicians is stop the drug and see the effect. More often than not, it is a 
those related effect rather than in idiosyncratic effect. And whenever there is a cholestatic liver disease, the only indication of doing a biopsy is either you have a either a small duct, small bile duct disease, or an overlap syndrome, or if there is a doubt in the MRCP. Short of that, things like uh, MRCP, fibro scan, viral markers will give you diagnosis more often than not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jayanti, do you have any? Yeah. Uh, most most of ask? the patients, most of the patients with IBD or ulcerative colitis are already on steroids, no? So I personally feel the liver biopsy actually is usually, um, usually we would really not do, especially in patients who are on steroids. So, the, so, so, the other, yeah, so the other question was that most of the patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's are all lean and hyperproteinemic. So the NAFLD paper was referring to lean NASH or actual people people with uh, huge bmis so one of the risk factors which was described in these studies was also the uh, prolonged use of steroids which might be leading to non alcoholic fatty liver disease and in fact in one of these studies the prevalence of nafld as compared to the control population was almost double so non ibd uh, versus ibd patients the ibd patients the prevalence of nafld was almost double and uh, uh, although I would I would uh, agree with you when you are saying that many patients would be lean, but there they would be those patients who are having active or poorly controlled IBD, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. But all other well controlled patients who are uh, who are on steroids or uh, other drugs, I think they would be hale and hearty and would be putting on weight like any other person. Yeah, I think I'll agree with Kaushal. If you know. The incidence and the prevalence of NFLD will depend on the metabolic factors which are prevalent in the general population. The fact that they are lean and thin is because of the progression of the disease. To begin with, they have the same risk factors. That is precisely the reason why the prevalence of NFLD is so high in ulcerative colitis. It at the fag end of their continuing ongoing inflammatory process that they tend to become hypoproteinemic and lose weight. But their baseline metabolic factors continue to be prevalent. So I need to uh, quickly move on to the panel discussion, which we've been all waiting for. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, some of the questions. Uh, uh, so now for this panel discussion, uh, uh, we have uh, this panel discussion on uh, approach or the problems with the an HBSAG positivity in a patient with inflammatory bowel disease is going to be moderated by uh, two supremos. Uh, first of all, Dr. P. N. Rao, who's director of hepatology, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. And uh, along with him, because we would have Professor Anil Arora also doing the moderation. And uh, we have, as our panelists, um, we have Dr. Anand Kulkarni, a consultant in hepatology and liver transplantation, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. Uh, Dr. Neera Joshi, the, the consultant at Nepal Medicity Hospital. Welcome, Neeraj. And uh, do we have Dharmesh Kapoor, consultant hepatologist, Yashoda Hospital? Yeah, I think he's joined. He's joined. He's joined. He's mobile. Yeah. Okay, okay. Dharmesh, welcome. So, uh, with this, uh, it's over to Dr. P. N. Rao and then Dr. Anil Arora to take us through the next half an hour or so to discuss issues of hepatitis B positive patient in uh, hepatitis B surface antigen positive patient. Over to you, Dr. P. N. Yes. yes. Wanted to have a big thank you, uh, Dr. Because for all IBDologists, and as an IBDologist, 
the minuscule of a liver disease has already been 0.35, you know, but you remembered as wanted as. On the other hand, one of the very first patients all happen. What is important is that their population risk of death here after excluding all the other social madan has already talked about how to go about. As I already told you, that if in okay, with this, we'll go on to the uh, some. Some who have come already, the, the Dr. Ramesh Kapoor and Dr. An, Dr. Yes, oh, sir. yes, thank you, yes, thank sir. you, Dr. Ramesh. What I first I will start with is that you mentioned Already there is some question already about the are these ABD patients more prone to get uh, a palsy? Ramesh, can you cite on? So I agreed to joining this panel to be educated, sir. Uh, that is the first thing, first uh, disclosure. And uh, this day and age, uh, one is not seeing too many hepatitis B patients, at least in the center where I work, and I think that might be common to the other tertiary care centers too. But coming back to what is mentioned in uh, published literature, the prevalence of hepatitis B surface antigen in this group of patients is probably no different from the general population. So there are some studies which have said that it might be slightly higher than the general population, but my answer would be that it is probably almost the same as the general population. Uh, Dr. Oshal also has passed in passing me at the and then. The Well, can you take over? Uh, we can ask the next question. I will just uh, out the test. Start with the next question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, let's move on to Dr. Kulkarni. Dr. Kulkarni, how do you know that the reactivation, what do you do? Suppose HBCG is positive, what do you do about it? Recently, patient comes with HPSCG positive patient has underlying IPD. How do you start moving? First thing would be as routine to any other patient with hepatitis B. You would like to look at the LFT, ALT levels, and uh, ultrasonography, the liver architecture, fibro scan if if possible, fibro scan, uh, liver liver elastography, and uh, E antigen and uh, DNA levels. Based on that, the treatment will be depending on the standard guidelines. That is, E negative, more than 2,000 elevated ALT, treat the patient. E positive, more than 20,000 elevated ALT, treat the patient. Any gray zones, either biopsy or uh, transient elastography. Coming to yeah. transient elastography in these patients, if the patients have elevated ALT, a cutoff of more than 12 is indicated of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for treatment. The ALT is normal, if the LSM is more than 9, then we need to treat the patient. 
Do you think just the same same rule would apply whether the patient has IPD or not? Would it matter if the patient has underlying IPD? Would you like to look at the therapy which the patient is taking, or you will apply? Uh, the if the the patient is on long term steroid therapy or is been planned for steroid therapy, I would tend to add him on uh, Nux uh, NAS. The patient is not planned for any immunosuppressant signs. He's on only uh, mesalamine or any other therapy. Uh, I would not be hesitant in waiting for the virus to reactivate. Actually, what Anand said, apart from assessment of the damage, first thing is what is the serology which you have to do? Anti HB and anti HB. Because why you have to do anti HB? That there is what is called a zero reversion. Means those people who have had earlier either by the natural infection, they got anti HBS level. They will have a reversion once there is a some immune suppression. They will lose their antibody state and even acquire PSAG the reactivation. Uh, coming to Dr. Neeraj, Neeraj, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, one for you in the sense that how does it really matter in these people that the immune suppression then occurred? How does it react? How serious it is, basically? Because we have acute hepatitis coming on in other patients. Got a reactivation coming on in patients who have stopped the treatment. Why is that it's so important to know in this? So, uh, reactivation in uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients can be associated with the disease flare. Uh, and the risk of disease flare is a lot more in patients who are on immune suppression. The usual uh, pattern is first they have uh, a rise, first they have a reactivation where the SBB DNA goes up, but once you stop the immune suppressant, say if the steroids have been tapered off or the patient is off anti-TNF, then there often is a disease flare. And this disease flare can be uh, asymptomatic, or it could be uh, sometimes associated with liver failure and even death. And the risk of liver failure and death in patients with immune, who have, had, who have been exposed to immune suppressant is a lot more compared to normal people means that any kind of a reactivation of the B will be not be taken. They have to be That's aggressively they have been followed up because uh, morbidity and the mortality are quite significant, especially with the, the drugs like Tifumab. Dr. Dharmesh, how common is this reactivation in having said that it is is also high. How commonly does the reactivation occur in the diabetes for being on the various? So the figures vary from different parts of the world, especially Western Hemisphere versus the Eastern Hemisphere, and uh, depending also on what kind of therapy the patient has been. So I think uh, it might be also appropriate at this juncture to talk about two categories of patients with the hepatitis B markers, those who are surface antigen positive, and much more importantly, those who are surface antigen negative, but anti-core total positive. And anti-core total mm -hmm. positive can be sub further subdivided into those who have got a measurable anti-HBS and those who are anti-HBS negative. So far greater prevalence of anti-core positivity in our part of the world also. Now, coming back to your question as to what is the incidence, it depends on how you define it. So, whether you define it just by an elevation of the liver enzymes or you define it by the DNA. So, the liver enzymes would not be elevated in majority of patients unless you have suspected it. And like Dr. Neeraj said that once you reduce the immunosuppression or stop it, that is the time that you start seeing the hepatitic injury. That is why if you believe in the preemptive approach and not the prophylactic approach, you have to have a good handle on the HPV DNA levels. So if the DNA levels increase by say two logs or someone who's a viremic, any degree of viremia is demonstrated. And the recommendations are that you should definitely check for these every one to three months. Then that is how you would define the reactivation in a given patient. 
if you define it at a time when the patient has got a symptomatic hepatic illness or the patient becomes they has symptomatic jaundice then probably you lost the plot so the the severe course and mortality is not as high as it was described in yesterday in chemotherapy patients but still you may end up losing about 2 to 7% of patients once they have symptomatic flare so i think far more important for our part of the world is that these patients anti course uh, total status as well as an anti hp if it is anti hps positive might want to have a preemptive policy but what i do in my clinical practice is that the cost of uh, doing the dna test is far greater than the cost of putting the patient on nukes and if someone is anti core totally positive i would put them on nukes uh, but now i think it is also proven to know then when we talk of reactivation when we talk of specifics in inflammatory bowel disease i know the experience has said that ananda dot fossil on anti tnf agent have this in reactivation because there is a corresponding data which can be extrapolated for the utility of infliximab let's we'll say in you know non pi uh, condition like uh, ankylosing spondylitis in 7 lakh patient there was not even one single zero conversion on infliximab 7 lakh patient is it a problem is it a big problem i to want to know the personal partial so uh, i think uh, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis i think uh, i have seen one reactivation but None in patients with the uh, IBD who in on PTNF. I think it is very only only thing is you know the immune suppressants upon the ward dose which because the corticosteroids alone is not much and uh, it causes only when more than twenty milligrams for longer period more than four then it becomes significant. More than that, if somebody is on combination more than steroid and otherwise also amount of reactivation of the steroid alone is very low actually. but we've been steroid really but if it added upon to other drugs which have been used in ibd then the reactivation rate goes that is basically combination okay, coming to neeraj neeraj how do you know that this is acute hepatitis b or a reactivation that is a mood question with more often than uh, So it, it can be sometimes uh, very difficult to say whether this is acute hepatitis B or whether this is a reactivation. Uh, I think uh, we could look at hepatitis B core antibody. And if the teeter is high, then that is probably uh, more of acute hepatitis B, IgM. We could also look at the hepatitis B SVB DNA level. If it is more than, I think, five log, then it's more likely that this is reactivation of chronic hepatitis B. I think there was a paper suggesting that if it is more than five log, then that would go more in favor of chronic hepatitis B. If it is acute hepatitis B, we'd like to put the patient who is already on immunosuppression. Suppose he has received a blood transfusion outside. We like to put him on antivirals. Is does this patient has a higher chance of developing chronic? Is it with an immune competent adult who has only? So I, I would I would think so. Yes, uh, immunocompromised patients can go on to have a chronic hepatitis B after uh, an infection with uh, after an acute infection with hepatitis B. So I would be more swayed towards putting these patients on antivirals. For acute hepatitis B, if the bilirubin is more than 10 <clears throat> or the INR is elevated, that is the reason when we start them on antivirals. The bilirubin is on lower side and the DNA is undetectable. If, you, if it is acute hepatitis B, <clears throat> then I would not be starting him on uh, nukes. Anand, what you are talking is a study which has been published from IAC immunocompetent person. We are talking of a scenario which the patient is already immunocompromised. This ALT may not be as briskly elevated as uh, the very rightly said as would happen in an immunocompetent person. Because to have elevation of ALT, you need to have substantial immunity, which is already compromised and plummeted because of immunosuppression. So I think we have to be liberal in using antiviral, as Neeraj said. Even if, first of all, it is not easy to distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not able to do uh, anti-HBSCG quantitatively. In fact, there is something called of six international units. 
we do not get a quantitative level done. So I think going by the practical reality and the fact that immunosuppression is, has more chance of leading to chronicity, I'll prefer to put my patient on immunosuppression, on uh, antiviral agents during the stage of immunosuppression. There are, there are two things, you know, two questions have come up. In this. One, I would doesn't know that, you know, or he may say that only I have taken. Uh, how do we know, you know, what will you do? Second thing is, we know that everybody has to be are there. What time? When do you? Which is the best time to screen? So I think the best time to screen is before you have initiated the immunosuppression for a given patient. And uh, that should be the, also the most logical thing to do. Now, as regards the vaccination, if somebody says that they have had just one dose and then they could not complete the schedule, I would give them the second dose at the time they come to me. And like I said, that uh, should uh, do the analysis of their serology as well as vaccination, probably we, before we uh, commence them on immunosuppression. And then the second dose should happen about four weeks later. If somebody has not been vaccinated at all, there are various regimens available. For example, the fast track, which is 0, 1, 2, and 12. If someone has taken two doses and is not sure of the third dose, then I would give them the third dose at that stage. So that is the important thing to remember that you don't have to restart the whole cycle again. Now, coming to the efficacy of vaccination and the IBD population in general, there are studies which have reported that the efficacy of the vaccination in these patients is lower compared to the general population. So an anti-HPS titer of more than 10, you would be able to get roughly in about 50% of patients. And an anti-HPS of more than 100, you'll be able to get only in about a third of patients, which is very different from what you will get in the general population. Anand, now we're coming to the vaccination. To screen, right time is part of the beginning of the disease. What are your recommendations? You know, what is the ideal dose? How many times you have? The double dose we have to give it to the, the fourth dose required for, as Dharmesh has already told you, that the, the rates are lower, much lower than the other. Yes, sir. So there was a meta-analysis from PGI, which was published in APT. It was an excellent study, including almost 21 studies and uh, 2,000 plus patients. They showed either you give a, a standard dose or a higher dose, the response remains the same. The 63% who achieve almost uh, more than 10, 10 international units and 40% who achieve uh, more than 100. So either of them, you just give a standard dose to them, 0, 1, and 6, or 0, 1, and 2 if, you, if the patient is in hurry. Recently, there are some studies from uh, HEPLISAV, uh, which is a CPG conjugated vaccines, which have shown some more better efficacy than the alum adjuvated uh, vaccines. They are almost response of almost 70% uh, in these patients, 70 plus 70%. Um, right. I don't know the yeah, availability. Yes, yes. Anand, you continue. Sorry. Sorry sir. The availability is still a problem about the this vaccine. <laughs> Dr. Rao, we are discussing and assessment for antigen and antibody. We are still at the same level of economic development as we were in 1947, we got the independence. We were the sixth largest economy at that time, we are still, still the sixth largest economy. We were the low middle income good country in 1947, we continue to be the same. Even at developed world, the Awareness about the vaccination and the level of antibodies is to the tune of only 23%. Is it not true? I am addressing to you a very philosophical question to you because you have been a president of the So why should we be talking of IBD? Why not everybody who comes to you as a gastroenterologist? Why should we think of BEC and antibody level? So this is something which can be used to any time later on. The patient has come in contact with you. Everybody, I be I could be very picky. Because I could be a 
Why not across the board? Because even in developed world, fairness about vaccination is very low. So when would we be able to eradicate this? You are muted, muted, Jayanti, you are muted, unmute, unmute, yeah. Uh, in, I, in my practice, I screen all my patients and I found that only, um, <clears throat> only about less than 10 percent were actually vaccinated, you know, with anti-HBS being high. And about uh, nearly 53 or 50 or even 63 percent had no vaccination at all. So in, in my practice, I screened for all the three markers. And as Dr. Dharmesh was seeing, we are seeing a lot of cases of anti-HBC total being positive. So that is something, and uh, I do screen for all, all the patients. All the patients come to me, and I ask them, all the entire family, to get vaccinated. Others I don't test, but the index patient I test, and I to request them to spread the message and ask all the members to get vaccinated. Anand, can think? I come in? Can I come in? Yeah. So, so I think the 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 algorithm on deciding whom to vaccinate in our country, most centers still follow the standard viral screen dictum, which is to check for the HBSAG anti-HCV and HIV 1 and 2 because that is the cheapest test available and if HBS AG is negative, we vaccinate them. But the better algorithm probably will go with the anti-core total positivity and then decide. But that test costs more. Now, like ma'am said that in her practice, she finds that only about 10 or 15 percent of patients might be anti-HBS positive, but that does not mean that they do not have anti-HBS. So somebody could have a non-detectable anti-HBS, but if you were to inject the virus into this patient, he would mount a response. So this whole algorithm is a very complicated one. And only when you have liberal amounts of money at your disposal, you can play around this. You can just give this patient one shot and you will find that's suddenly the anti-HBS will become 100 or 1000. That's what I do. Yeah, that's what I do. The memory cells are there. So I give them one shot of vaccination and then check the anti-HBS. Yeah. Uh, Anand, do you think that the double dose will help? You know, some studies are there where they are given the double dose and they found that the 75 percent response was there as compared to the single dose. This, uh, the study which I quoted, there have been contradictory studies, but the study which I quoted actually says that either if you single dose or double dose, the response remains the same. So, okay. Hey, very important to remember that if you are presuming that the patient has immunocompromised state, that means patients who are on dialysis, by default you have to start on accelerated double dose regimen. So in concern with IBD, sir, in concern with IBD. Uh, in, in, in CKD, I totally agree that you need to give double dose. Okay, uh, Dr. Neera. I think the echo, I think the echo guideline uh, recommends using double dose. At a fast track system that what Dr. Zarnes Kapoor was talking about, you give 0, 1, 2, and 12 a double dose. That's what is recommended by ECHO guidelines. Okay, Dr. Neera, you know, we'll just wind up now in about one or two uh, questions now, uh, which has come. Uh, when do you, I mean, the starting the NAs in these people, uh, whether Entikavir or Chanafavir, you know, when do you start and when do you end? When will you stop? Uh, in a reactive I think approach. as soon as we uh, detect the uh, there is reactivation, we have to start treatment on these patients, and then we continue monitoring these patients with uh, a regular uh, DNA level um, and also their liver function test. If the patients are really sick, then they need to be admitted. If they are not that sick, uh, but they have had a disease flare, then we monitor them, say, monthly to three monthly basis, and we continue with the treatment. And uh, it also depends upon what we do with the immune suppressant, not just the uh, viral, antiviral treatment. If they are going to stop the immune suppressant at some point, uh, once they have stopped the immune suppressant, we continue with the treatment for up to uh, at least six months is what is recommended. And some of the patients may have, you know, uh, active uh, uh, liver disease. Uh, in these patients, you just have to continue uh, till till you have, uh, say, till uh, you decide when you want to stop the treatment. And Not one, in keeping with the IBD, but for their disease, uh, disease liver. One practical issue which comes is that, you know, these people do not respond immediately. It takes a, quite a long time for them to respond. And because in, in other patients, you know, where regular patients, you, know, you can find that the immediately the SGPT comes, DNA levels come down. But the immune compromised people like this, you know, 
and that's why the morbidity and the mortality is very high it will take nearly sometimes one or two three months you know for all the if the, especially if the bilirubin level is a very high to start with it takes nearly two to three months for it to come down so one has to carefully follow them up for the complications dr anil before mm -hmm. i wind up and then summarize do you have anything any comment or any question or any Dr. Rao, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, yes. The, the question is that in a patient with IBD who is on uh, steroids or whatever drug he's on, how would you, when would you screen these patients for reactivation? You recommend ACLT at three monthly interval. When to suspect? That is, they don't have jaundice. So when to suspect? Suddenly there's 110, 1, 210 ACLT. So when should one suspect reactivation in a patient with IBD on steroids? Yeah, see, it depends on. Yeah, I think that is a very relevant question, Dr. Jayanti. <clears throat> what I do in practice is the moment patient lands up with you with ulcerative colitis, I'll get a baseline hepatitis B surface antigen and anti anti HPS. If antibody is positive, yeah, HPS is negative. Chance of this person reactivation is very low so unless there is a evidence of liver function abnormality you do not need to monitor the only indication is we are giving something like rituximab how the patient is undergoing hematopoietic malignancy and stem cell therapy so that is a different ball game altogether short of that if the patient is hps which is negative and poor antibody positive again i will test the anti hps if antibody anti hps is positive we'll just monitor him if you're not able to monitor, there is something called expectant policy, which I totally detest. I believe if the patient is HPS AG positive, all of them should be given antiviral therapy because the indication of use of antiviral therapy are becoming more and more liberal. Even either has come down to a 30 age of E antigen positive patient, fibro scan of more than 10, all of these are the indications rather than going by a particular two times rise in ALT. So what I'll do is if, the pay, if I'm not sure of the status of antibody, Unless there is a there is a strong anti anti immunosuppressive agent like rituximab on steroid which are being tapered, they have only moderate risk. In moderate risk, you don't need to monitor unless the patient's antibody is negative. If the patient antibody has never been formed, then you can repeat an HPV DNA after a month or after three months. It yeah. depends on the degree and the total duration of the immunosuppression. Uh, so thank you. Uh, let me summarize the whole proceedings today. Before that, you know, I'd like to tell you that the amount of uh, the normally the, when, the, when, when we give the vaccination, more than 10 milliequivalent, they say it is sufficient. But in the UK guidelines, they say that it has to be more than 100 international, milli international units uh, for these people to be protected. So, summarizing, suppose if you're an ibidologist, altered liver chemistry is there, then you have to look for many other causes which are common to us like an NAFLD and then other causes. Then screen them for a PSC. Simple MRCP will do. If you still persistently think about it, you have to do small duct for a liver biopsy. On the other hand, if you are a hepatologist, even if the patient is not symptomatic because the uh, IBD is very high in them, one has to do a mandatory colonoscopy in these patients, right? And second thing is that the best time to, to screen these patients for HBSAG is at the time of the diagnosis. And there's the best time when the vaccine results are very high in these people, right? And any time during the course, if they have developed a jaundice, and then it has to be taken as a reactivation unless otherwise proved. And these people have to be aggressively followed up since the morbidity and mortality is very high. And with this, I think I will wind up this uh, panel discussion. Um, I thank all the panelists and Dr. Anil and then Anand Kulkarni and Dr. Neeraj Joshi, Dr. Jayanti. Thank you very much. I hand over to Dr. Ramesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. P. N. Rao, Professor Anil Arora, and also thank you, uh, Neeraj, Anand, and uh, Dharmesh. Uh, uh, it is a very interesting uh, uh, discussion that took place. Uh, uh, Dr. P. N. Rao summarized it beautifully, but I think one thing, of course, is uh, the, the discussion also revolved around uh, whether the biologicals are, pose any risk as far as whether 
concerned. So would I be right in summarizing, adding one more point to the summary saying that biologicals do not pose any additional risk as far as reactivation is concerned. Am I right? So I think uh, the jury on this is out because uh, uh, still out because we so do not know even this just new like drug to it has been put in the moderate so no additional risk but tofacitin a jack two inhibitor yeah. has been yeah. put in the moderate yeah uh, I'll, uh, so your, your voice is received. breaking you need to have breaking. Uh, so, so are the biologicals are okay, but tofastiv we need to be still a bit careful. We yeah. still don't have the final word as yet. Am I right? Okay, we need to be still a bit <laughs> careful. Okay. Uh, uh, just pick, uh, picking up on a few questions that have been sent in. Uh, first is, uh, may I request, uh, I think I'll ask uh, Kaushal this one. Safety of azathioprine in... Um, uh, yes. With ulcerative colitis without CLD, how long and how to monitor the liver function test? How long and how to monitor? So I think uh, uh, regarding the safety of uh, azathioprine, I think just because a person has PSC or IBD, it does not make them more prone to hepatotoxicity by azathioprine. Can you hear me? No, there's some audio disturbance that is happening. Uh, Rupa, I don't know. Uh, we are getting the uh, voice back. That is why. Rupa, I don't know. Side, uh, from that side. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming back. That is why this disturbance. I think they tried to check it, but I think no. uh, now we can hear. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think azathioprine, like we've been using in other indications like autoimmune hepatitis and uh, IBD alone without PSC, I think the same way they, uh, the, it has to be given, I don't think there is any increased risk of hepatotoxicity in the same way who have IBD PSC. So uh, I think we would monitor, uh, I think the, we are more concerned about bone marrow toxicity than we are more concerned about hepatotoxicity. And for that hepatotoxicity, now, uh, after the initial uh, 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 stabilization of the dose in which we monitor the uh, CBC every week while we are increasing the dose, I think once once in three months monitoring should be sufficient, which includes CBC as well as LFT. So, That's so usual practice. So, so the message of course is that we need not adopt anything different from what we usually do. Right. Visited. Okay, uh, a second, uh, I think I would ask Dr. Anil Arora, hepatitis C virus, we, not, we did not discuss hepatitis C virus. Hepatitis C virus in a patient with ulcerative colitis, how to monitor the patient who has completed the DA therapy uh, for hepatitis C virus and is on bio. How to monitor the patient who has completed therapy? Yeah, there's something, something going on. Yes, and is on biology. There's something something wrong with the audio. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not. Okay, carry on. The, the question is with respect to hepatitis C virus infection. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes. Am I audible? You are. You are audible. You are. Yes, you you are. are. Okay. No. Yeah. There, there is. Yeah. There is one study which has shown that if the patient needs treatment for hepatitis C, the biological can be safely given, but there is no interaction. If the patient deserves the use of DAAs, it can be safely administered. I think, Dr. Anil, could you just put off your video, switch off your video and then talk? Put off your video and then talk. Okay, am I audible now? 
there is one study dr uh, ramesh which has shown that in case the patient needs antiviral that is direct acting antiviral drugs for hepatitis c they can be safely administered and there is no interaction with the virus the patient deserves treatment for hepatitis c you can continue there is no proof that immunosuppression will flare up hepatitis c as against hepatitis b Correct. that is the current status okay thank you very much uh, i think the last question uh, dr mohan khatka has sent in this question and i probably request dr p n rao dr if you... mohan khatka has sent this question no this uh, some something seriously wrong with the audio so i'm uh, 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 i really apologize uh, the the question is when the audio so uh, Uh, Rupa, I think uh, uh, since there is a problem with this audio, I think uh, we are not able to carry on with the question answer session. Uh, since uh, on the question answer session, write it on the chat box, Dr. Ramesh. Well, I, uh, Rupa, can it can this be projected onto the chat box? Uh, yes, we Rupa, can. We... The, the the question is when to stop treatment. Hepatitis B once started in IBD patients with immunosuppression. Yes. No. See, uh, it all depends upon which one has caused the immunosuppression. For a very high ones like a rituximab and other thing, we have to give it for at least for one to one and a half years after the stoppage of the drug. Whereas for steroids and other things where the immune suppression is not much, you can stop after six months after the dosage is over. So it depends upon which immune suppression which you are using it. Stronger uh, the immune suppression, longer the duration. A corollary to this would be straight away in a patient with IBD who develops acute viral hepatitis B, do you use antivirals straight from the very beginning itself? All patients, 100%. Do you, uh, do you do you do you start antivirals and all of them? In acute viral hepatitis, yes, I would. If it is a de novo acute viral hepatitis, different from a reactivation. De novo acute hepatitis virus, and then definitely in immunocompromised people, you have to um, use the antivirals right from the beginning, and do after six months later HBSCG again. If the HBSCG conversion occurs, then you can stop. But right from the beginning in these people, you have to start the antivirus. Then you... Okay. So, but, you agree, but what about... What do you say? No, I think I'll put it in, a, in, in different words, what Dr. Rao has just said. So, acute viral hepatitis in a patient who has IBD and is immunosuppressed, very difficult to differentiate between reactivation right. and uh, AVH. So, you have to treat it any which ways, whether the patient... Uh, irrespective of differentiating between AVH and reactivation. Second, regarding stopping, since this patient has developed a flare and is likely to remain on immunosuppression, maybe receive immunosuppression later on. So I would give him uh, antivirals either for lifelong or till, like Dr. Rao said, till the HBSAG disappears. Till the HBSAG disappears or would you wait for the antibody to appear? Yeah, when the antibody appears, we should continue till that. So it yeah. should be the. So, so that is also controversial. That is also controversial whether we should stop after HBCG disappearance, six months after HBCG disappearance, or wait for zero conversion of surface antigen to stop it. So that is also controversial. There is lack of data on that. Oh, absolutely, because you do not know how these patients would form antibodies. So if they are right. not forming antibodies to vaccination, what makes us feel that they would form an antibody to? I think uh, I am a little at a loss uh, in this discussion. The message that should go out is that every patient who's got a marker of hepatitis B should be treated. If you are not treating these patients and they are anti-HBS positive, then you can have a preemptive approach. But for all practical purposes, these patients should be prophylaxed. Great. I think that is an important message that needs to go down. Or go, and then you stop treatment only after they become HPSC negative. And uh, uh, the matter of controversy, of course, is do you wait for zero conversion or do you confirm zero conversion? Am I right? 
Yep. Okay then, right. So I think we'll have to bring curtains uh, down onto this discussion because there's not many issues left, but I'm sorry we can't go on more because we have to actually welcome our friends from uh, Iraq. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Salami, gastroenterologist and hepatologist, College of Medicine, Fallujah University, and Dr. Altun Mahmoud Saleh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist, lecturer at College of Medicine. Hauler Medical University, they, they are with us today to just give us a brief glimpse about IBD in their country. Over to you. Can we have the video, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Mohanad Salami gastroenterologist from Iraq. Iraq is one of the country of the Middle East and it is the most culturally diverse nations in the area. Baghdad is the capital of Iraq and we have two official languages, Arabic and Kurdish. The uh, population around 40 million, the area around 437,000 uh, square kilometer. Uh, the most common consuming uh, food in our country is the rice, bread, meat, but unfortunately it has changed toward the Western, Western lifestyle nowadays. Hello, I am Dr. Altun Mahmoud Saleh from Iraq, Kurdistan. Today I want to talk about trend of IBD in Iraq. Uh, although till now we don't have IBD registry and we don't have exact local data, but just like other Asian countries, there is rapidly increasing number of IBD cases in Iraq. Previously, we had more cases of ulcerative colitis, but nowadays we are facing increasing number of Crohn's disease, stricturing and fistulizing Crohn's, especially in teenage and young adults. This can be a reflection of change of lifestyle of our population especially new generation toward Western type lifestyle. Uh, and this is the fact that IBD is a lifestyle disease. Now we are happy to be a member of IBD ENC who face the emerging epidemic of the IPD in our country. Together we are better. Thank you very much uh, to our friends from Iraq for this glimpse of uh, in, 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 into the wonderful country. Uh, welcome to IBD ENC and we hope that uh, you will benefit as much as we do benefit with our association. So that's the end. We come to the end of this session. We took exactly one hour, 45, almost 45 minutes. Uh, this is what we had aimed for. And I'm, I, I thank the speakers, I thank uh, Dr. P. N. Rao, Dr. Professor Anil Arora uh, for an excellent moderation, uh, touching on various issues, uh, some of them controversial, some of them without, uh, they're all gray zones, but I think there were important messages also that we came up with. Thank you very much. And with this, it is over to Dr. Jayanti for uh, 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 closing remarks and of course the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Um, Dr. Rupa, would like to mention about the next program. That's on 23rd, I think, no? September? That's correct. Okay. So it's IBD and surgery, right? From tra traditional to recent advances. Fine. So on behalf of our course, yeah. Any, anything else, Rupa, you'd like to mention? Okay, so on behalf of uh, our course, the stuff that's required. Friday, September twenty third, twenty twenty one, twenty twenty eight, surgery in IBD. We have a surgeon as well as a medical team. Yeah, I think. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ramesh, and I think on behalf of our course director, Dr. Rupa, and my co chair, Dr. Ramesh, we thank all the 
uh, guest speakers, Dr. Anil, Dr. Kaushal, the panelists, Professor P. N. Rao, Share Dr. Green, and uh, and our uh, uh, participants who brought through this wonderful session. A common problem, but I think often overlooked, on the need for vaccination in patients with IBD. And I think the pathophysiology was very interesting. You never. And I have never really thought about that or pathophysiology of the liver in IPT. So that was a wonderful talk. And thank you all. And uh, hoping to see you all during the next week. Thank you. I think nothing is over before we thank our academic partners. And uh, we at IPT PNC, we are actually grateful to Janssen, Dr. Reddy, Microlab, and to Peter for being a strong academic partner in all our events. Thank you.